How to build and manage powerhouse teams. I love this question. The reason that I love it is it's filled with contradictions. Example, if you asked 100 of the world's top performing managers and you said, hey, what makes you successful as a manager? You might hear this. Well, I'm participative. I listen and empathize with the needs of my team and I help them be their best. At the same time, you might hear, I'm a disciplinarian. I expect perfection, I demand perfection, and I work my team hard. I don't let them get away with much for their own good. At the same time, you might hear, what makes me a great manager is that I recruit the best talent. Then, no, no, no. What I do is I ensure we're all aligned around a common vision and a set of core values, and I build the environment to get the best out of my people. Now, this could go on and on for a million years, and what I wanna do is get down to the root level of what makes an effective manager, a level that will always be true, has always been true, and gives you perspective on what it really takes to manage well. Answer is this, management is the application of force. Now by force, I don't mean coercion or power or manipulation. I mean something very specific. Every system, as I discussed in the last video, must get energy from the surrounding environment. That's true for you, it's true for your team. That means that the team must shape the environment and it must respond to changes in the environment. And it must do so as a whole system, including the parts that make it up. Now, you don't have to understand why an individual or a team behaves the way it does. Instead, we just have to observe using this framework how the team is behaving and that will reveal a tremendous amount of information about what that team needs in order to be more successful. Put another way, what force you need to apply in order to get the most out of the individuals and out of the team. Now, if a system is demonstrating a high drive to, to shape the environment, it's focused on the parts, we call that the producing force. The producing force causes things to produce results, to generate, to make, to transform. So think about your own life last week. When you were expressing the producing force, you were focused on the tasks to accomplish, on about winning the deal, completing the project, making things happen, checking off your list. You're moving quickly, you're focused on getting things done. But that's not enough to be successful. There also has to be the ability to respond to changes that are happening in the environment. We call that the stabilizing force. Now, when you were stabilizing last week, you were moving at a more methodical pace. You were focused on analyzing the details and bringing things together so that it was orderly efficient, controllable. It's different than the innovating force, which shows up when you're shaping the environment and doing it on a big picture basis. So last week, when you were expressing the innovating force in your life, you were trying to disrupt the status quo. You were being creative, adaptive, seeking to create change on a big picture level. And you can contrast that with the unifying force, which shows up when you're trying to respond to change and keep the whole together. So last week, when you were spending time unifying your family, you're trying to create harmony, coalesce, when you're trying to create in your team a sense of we're all in it together, everybody's on the same page, we're working as one unit, that's the unifying force. Now, these forces don't show up in equal measure in your system. If one force is out of balance, it's going to exhibit some telltale signs. Your job as a manager is to know the forces at play and then apply the missing force so that you can create higher performance. Now, you can remember these four forces of management by just recalling these simple words, P.S. I love you. Think P.S. I love you and you'll remember the four forces. Now, look around your business. The producing force shows up in sales, in production, anywhere there's that drive to accomplish the short range work and get it done. The stabilizing force will show up in functions like accounting, quality assurance, anywhere there's a need to bring more control, regulation, order, efficiency to a process. The innovating force will show up where there's that drive to be innovative, adaptive, creative. You'll see it in strategy, entrepreneuring, research and development, long range marketing. And you'll see that unifying force show up anywhere there's a need to have people working well in harmony together, account management, human resource development, that sense of esprit de corps, within the company itself. All four of these forces are present. Some will be more present than others, and your job as a manager is to know that force that's at play and then apply the force that the system needs. Let's think about this in a little bit different lens. Let's look at it in your family. So the producing force in that family is that drive to support the family, 
uh, even to produce new adults, right? The stabilizing force are the rules, the norms, the expectations in that family. The innovating force is that family's ability to adapt to changes happening in society, in the economy, and to be prepared for the future. And the unifying force is that sense of love and loyalty in the family. Now imagine you're part of a family where there's no producing force. Maybe the dad loses his job. What happens to that family? Well, there's a crisis. There's a missing force. So the family has to respond. Right? They have to find some way to, to reassert the producing force in the family. If not, that's not going to be a successful family. But imagine a different family where there's no rules or norms or expectations. There's total chaos. Right, That family doesn't function very well. Or imagine a family that's got their head in the sand. They're acting like it's 1995 when it's 2014. Right, They're behind the curve. That family is not going to have an easy time of it adapting to change in the future. Or imagine a family without love or loyalty, right? That's an absence of the unifying force. That's not a family that you'd want to be a part of. And we're going to shift from forces into styles. So a management style is simply a way of managing the world around us. And it's that same nomenclature, P.S. I love you, will tell you how an individual or team is performing. So imagine that you have a rowboat. Before you is a person with a high producing force. We call that the big producer. Now this person is going to be focused on driving change, focused on parts or the task. They're going to be oriented towards what needs to get done and getting it done. So you put them in the rowboat and you say row. That person starts to row. They don't ask how long, how far. They're focused on the task. They execute on the task until you say stop. Contrast that with a person with a high stabilizing force. This is a person that is more oriented towards responding to change and making things controllable, efficient, and repeatable. And you say row, person is not going to row right away. They're going to want to slow down, analyze the situation, understand the direction of the prevailing winds and currents, the water temperature, create the most efficient rowing stroke, have an orderly plan, very detailed plan, and then in an efficient manner, they'll begin to go very different. Now contrast that with a person with a high innovating force and you put them in a rowboat and you say, row, you're going to say, awesome. What about if we put a sail on this baby or maybe a motor? That would be cool. What about that? Why not that? Hey, what about a glass bottom? That would be pretty epic. Let's try that. Contrast that with a person with a high unifying force. This is a drive to respond to change and keep everyone working together as a whole unit in harmony. And you say, row, and they're going to say, where are my friends? Where's the team? right? Let's do this together. So all, all four forces show up in each of our, our styles, right? We all have to exhibit a style of management that's some combination of these four forces. But because we're dealing with finite energy, we don't express each of these forces equally at any given point in time. In fact, we tend to exhibit a certain style, which is our way of managing the world around us. Now, your team members have a style, you have a style, and the team itself has a style. And how you can start to zone in on what style is being expressed is to just recognize that the producer style is really focused on what to do and getting it done. The stabilizer style is focused on how to do things, do it the right way, repeatedly every time. The innovator style is focused on why not? You know, why not this? Let's be disruptive, let's be creative. And the unifier is more focused on who is doing it how they're feeling, and keeping everyone working well together. One of the fastest ways to understand someone's style is to look at drains and gains and foes and friends of a person. So if a person is exhibiting a very high producer style, the lens they're going to look at is what's happening, what needs to be done. The drains for them are going to show up when there's a feeling of not having enough time. Okay, the reason they don't have enough time is they always have something to do. Check one thing off their task list and it's immediately on to the next thing. They experience gains and there's a tremendous feeling of accomplishment. There's a sense of momentum and results. Yes, we won the deal, uh, we made it happen. That's a gain. The foes for the producer are those people who feel like they just don't work as hard enough or fast enough as the producer does. And the friends are those who get on board and work just as hard and as fast as they do. Now, we can see caricatures of styles showing up all around us, especially in the movies. So here's a clip from a movie called Glengarry Glen Ross, which shows a person, classic role with Alec Baldwin. He's in dominant, big producer mode. Now, look how he shows up. Because we're adding a little something to this month's sales contest. As you all know, first prize is a Cadillac Eldorado. Anybody want to see second prize? Second prize is a set of steak knives. Third prize is you're fired. A, B, C. A always B, B, C, 
closing. Always be closing. Always be closing. Now, you'll notice who loves that clip the most. We can all laugh at it, but a big producer loves that clip. They think, yes, that's how people and leaders should be, right? Lead by example. It doesn't matter who you are, if you're a team player or not. It only matters if you execute and accomplish the goal. And so if you find yourself aspiring to work or be like that, there's a sign that there's a high producing force in your style. And if working for someone like that seems like a dreadful experience, it just means that you have a stronger style and one of the other forces at work in your personality where you can appreciate that it's not just about getting things accomplished. It's about doing things the right way or also being creative or having a powerful uh, vision and values, right? So I'm sharing these clips to just highlight what an extreme version of one style might look like so that you can learn to recognize it and spot it in yourself or in others around you. And let's contrast the producer with the stabilizer. The stabilizer, the lens is how to do things. The drains for them feels like lack of control. There's too much chaos, not enough control. That's a drain. The gains for them are a feeling of order and accuracy and repeatability. The foes naturally are those who don't follow the process. They don't do it right, right? They're disrupting the order. And the friends are those who follow the process. They do it right the first time, every time. Sure, they take a little bit more time, but they have this amazing attention to detail they do it right. They follow the process. Now, here's a clip of a high stabilizer in action. This is Humphrey Bogart. It's an old movie called Kane Mutiny. It's taking place in the middle of a world war. And you can see that this big stabilizer, this is an unhealthy stabilizer, what, he, what he's focused on. Mr. Merrick, Mr. Keith, the captain wants a meeting of all officers right away. Now, at one o'clock in the morning? Yes, sir. You know what it's about? Yes, sir. Strawberries. This is a gallon can. Yes, sir, it's a large can. Just took it from the pantry, sir. I suppose you're wondering why I called this meeting. As you all know by now, we had an excellent dessert for dinner tonight, ice cream and frozen strawberries. Well, about an hour ago, I, I sent Whitaker to the pantry to bring me another portion. He came back with the ice cream all right. But he said, sir, there ain't no more strawberries. Now, gentlemen, I do not believe that the officers of this ship consumed a full gallon of strawberries at dinner tonight, and I intend to prove it. Mr. Merrick, how many portions of ice cream and strawberries did you have? Two, sir. Whitaker, dole out a scoop of sand for each portion of strawberries. Yes, sir. Mr. Kiefer, how many for you? Three, Captain. The clip always makes me laugh. So again, I'm showing caricatures of unhealthy styles. The facts are that a great stabilizer in your environment can make everybody's life incredibly easy and orderly and efficient. It's awesome. But here's an example of a stabilizing force gone amok and an unhealthy style. And it's the middle of the war and they're getting everybody up in the middle of the night to you know, determine a breakdown in the process, right? There's a breakdown in order and efficiency and that's a crisis to an imbalanced stabilizer. Now you can contrast that with a high innovator, which will show up as a very, very different style. Their lens again is why not? Why not this? Why not that? Interestingly, the drains for a high innovator are the feeling of having too many ideas. What happens is an innovator can spin up an idea a minute and they spin up so many ideas it actually becomes a drain because they, they want to see them be successful. They want to see them come to fruition in the world. And it starts to feel exhausting. Like you can't fight your way out of a wet paper bag because you're just, you're, you're, you're suffocated by your own ideas. And what they love, the gains for a high innovator is this sense of people are buying into my ideas enthusiastically. And the foes are those who don't get it. They, they see this idea so clearly. It makes so much sense to them in the moment. It's just frustrating that people don't get it, right? So you can imagine a high innovator explaining a new creative idea to a high stabilizer. And the high stabilizer is like, wait, what? We are focused on the plan. We're trying to do this. And now you have this other idea, you know, get out of here. You don't understand. You don't have a, a toehold in reality, right? The friends though would be for a high innovator, like, yes, that's a brilliant idea. You're going to save us. This is a brilliant invention. Let's do it. Now, here's an example of a high innovator movie clip. It's actually not even in English. As they say, most of uh, communication is nonverbal, but you'll recognize this character and it's a classic high innovator in action. Oh, 
Actually, I'm not even sure what language that's in now that I think about it. You can see that for the high innovator, it's all about the ideas. There's uh, elation when an idea works, like nothing is better than that, than seeing what was held in your mind come forth into reality. That's exciting. And they like people who support those ideas and help bring them to life. This contrasts with the unifier style. The lens here is who, right? The relationships, the people, the drains for them are being in an environment where there's too many conflicts. And so they'll do what they can to try to remove the conflicts. The gains correspondingly are a sense of harmony and intimacy with the group, great teamwork. The foes for a high unifier would be someone who doesn't work well as a team, right? They're not supporting the team. And the friends would be those who add to the group. Now, quick example, let's say you have a manager who's a high producer, they could care less if a person's additive to the team. They only care if that person executes and works hard like they do and makes things happen. But a high unifier would care greatly if there's a person on the team who, even if they produce at a high level, is very disruptive to the sense of harmony and unification in the group. And so that would be an enemy to that unifier even though that person might produce at a high level. So here's a final film clip of a high unifier in action. It's from Legally Blonde, and you'll just see that no matter what, there's a drive to create harmony in the group, even if it's silly. Friends and foes together, united and bound. Closest to your neighbor instead of blowing up, and we'll find harmony and love in the tap tap. Silly, fun caricature, absolutely. High unifier, loves harmony, loves cohesion in the group, loves to feel like we're all working well together as a team. So as a manager, how do you put this into action? How do you make your job easier? Well, the first thing you need to recognize is to know the forces at play. As you recognize the force, then you can see what's missing and what's needed. So a couple rules of thumb here. Stop judging people. P.S. I love you is there not only to help you remember the four forces, but to appreciate and accept that all four forces are necessary for a system to be successful. And no single person has all four forces in equal measure. Each of us expresses a certain style that's a mix of these forces and all forces are needed at different times. So just because a person moves at a different pace than you or takes a different orientation or uses a different language, it doesn't mean that they are less than you or worse than you. They are needed and valued in the right setting. So the first thing you do is you stop judging people. Instead, you judge the force. So if a person comes into your office, they're moving at a fast pace, they're feeling frustrated, guess what? That's a high producing force in action. So you just say, oh, hey, there's the producing force. What does it need? Okay, producing force needs me to help them remove obstacles. Let's remove obstacles for this person. They'll get back on their way, executing again. A different person comes into your office. This time they're moving at a more methodical pace. They're feeling overwhelmed. Right? They seem kind of stuck in their head, moving at a slower pace. That's the stabilizing force in action. You don't judge that person. You say, oh, look, there's a stabilizing force. What does it need? Well, the stabilizing force needs data and time to process that data. So let me get them more information and set the uh, environment up so that they can process that information. And they'll come back in a little while with really grounded sense of what needs to happen and how to manage all those details. Awesome. Now a different person comes into your office. They're moving at a fast pace. They're really excited. They have a new idea to share. You don't judge them. You look at the force, say, oh yes, that's the innovating force in action. What does it need? It needs me to get excited and give buy-in and enthusiasm. I do that and guess what happens? That innovating force gets to process itself through and now it probably realizes itself that there's a lot of details here that need to get worked out. But you still allowed them to get excited and enthusiastic about the future vision, potential vision. Now, another person comes into your office and they're feeling kind of overwhelmed emotionally. They are distraught at something that happened to someone. And so what do they need? Well, first of all, you don't judge them. You look, hey, that's the unifying force. It needs a buddy. It needs a, a buddy to process through their feelings with. How can I slow down and connect and empathize with them? And so that, that need to process their feelings will move through. And now they're back in the game. Okay, so you always want to know the forces at play, and that's what management is. Know the forces at play, give the system the force that it needs, and you'll be a more effective manager.